Get me in at 10, Hellboy. Back in 2004, Guillermo del Toro blessed us with Hellboy, and then in 2008, the sequel Hellboy 2 The Golden Army was released. Both were great adaptations of the Dark Horse comics character. However, things took a turn this year when Neil Marshall took a swing at the beloved character. Starring Mila Jovovich and David Harbour, the film was once again based on the graphic novels, with Hellboy caught between the worlds of the supernatural and human, as he battles an ancient sorceress bent on revenge. Now, prior to the film's release, fans were of course excited at the prospect of a new Hellboy, especially one starring Stranger Things as David Harbour, and had a hard R rating. The movie was looking to be promising. That was up until it landed in our movie theaters. Now, although there was praise for Harbour's take on Hellboy, the rest of the movie fell short, with critics finding it to be complete and total garbage, with a series of scenes strung together with barely a path to guide them. Yep, that's a quote. A savage one at that. Thankfully, though, it just means we won't get yet another Hellboy. It's too soon, guys. Coming in at nine, The Hustle. Released back in May, The Hustle stars Anne Hathaway and Rebel Wilson as two con women, one low rent and the other high class, who team up to take down the men who have wronged them. Classic. The film itself is a gender flip take on the 1988 comedy Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which starred Michael Caine and Steve Martin as dueling con men vying over the territory of a seaside resort. However, something about the hustle missed the mark, and it went wrong real fast, with the film debuting to some of the highest critical drubbings of the year. The Chicago Sun Times wrote, I quote, If you don't see the long con coming in this story, either you're not paying attention, or no. That's the only possible explanation. Your mind wandered to the thoughts of better movies playing elsewhere, perhaps right next door to this debacle. Even with a running time of 93 minutes, the hustle dealt about an hour too long. Wow, straight savagery. Coming in at eight, The Fanatic. Guys, I'm so excited to talk about this movie, only because it might very well be the hottest trash I've ever seen in my whole life, and that's saying a lot. Released back in August, The Fanatic stars John Travolta, and that's about it, and follows a rabid film fan who stalks his favorite action hero and destroys the star's life. At this point, John Travolta is so far away from his Pulp Fiction days that I'm beginning to question whether they really even existed. In The Fanatic, John Travolta plays an autistic fan who very quickly goes off the rails. You would assume the film was handled with some sort of grace, maybe even sensitivity, but no, of course not, because this film was co-written and directed by Limp Biscuit's Fred Durst, which speaks wonders. Robert Abel from The Rap stated, I quote, The Fanatic is a brainless explosive foley which gives John Travolta free reign to mine the history of cringeworthy autism portrayals for an offensively garish Frankenstein pantomime of unhinged obsession. It ultimately suggests this side career for Durst should be well and truly snuffed out. Ultimately, The Fanatic makes Gotti look like the Godfather, and that's saying a lot. Coming in at number seven, replicas. Typically, Keanu Reeves never steers us wrong. I mean, he's John Wick for God's sake. He's well and truly cemented his action star career with films like Speed and The Matrix under his belt. Anyway, he took a wrong turn when he appeared in this year's train wreck that was Replicas. Directed by Jeffrey Natchamoff, it follows a scientist who becomes obsessed with bringing back his family members who died in a traffic accident. Now, Replicas were set up to be among the greatest films the sci fi genre has ever produced. However, However, it didn't turn out that way. The film was instead a complete and utter mess, with terrible writing and absurd storytelling, not to mention plot holes that you could drive a semi truck through. The film was so bad it forced Charles Bromesco to say, I quote, delivering the stilted language as if it might bite them on the tongue, and an evolutionary marvel, Reeves has figured out how to adapt to the hostile environment of mediocrity. And here he takes to the gobbledygook and gaps in logic like a genetically altered fish to water. Yikes, definitely scratch this movie off your watch list. Coming in at six, The Curse of La La Rona. Look, I've spoken about this film a lot on this channel and over on our sister channel, Top 5 Scary Videos, but guys, honestly, this film was hot trash. Better yet, it was cold, cold stale trash. Released back in April and starring Linda Cardellini and literally no one else of merit, The Curse of La La Rona follows a woman and her family who are plagued by a terrifying supernatural entity who wants nothing more than to take her children. Now, the legend itself is terrifying and definitely one to read up on, but this folklore film missed the mark and seemed to lack all of the creepiness the legend itself possessed. Alternate endings Tim Brayton said, it can only barely get jump scares right. Every single one of them for the film's first hour is set up, staged and timed exactly the same way, so that they start to feel less like visceral sucker punches and more like a baffling and unfunny running gag. Wow, 
Honestly guys, if you want to see the film, just watch the trailer instead. You get most of the meat without having to commit an hour and a half of your time. Trust. In at 5, Tyler Perry's and Medea Family Funeral. You just have to look at the IMDb score of 4.3 out of 10 to know this Tyler Perry film is going to be a train wreck. Released back in March, a Medea Family Funeral follows a joyous family funeral that becomes a nightmare when Medea and the crew travel to backwards Georgia and find themselves unexpectedly planning a funeral that might unveil unsavory family secrets. So shocking. Much suspense. The Medea series at this point seems to be unkillable, and I so wish that would change. The movie was baffling, which is really the only way to put it. The comedy is excruciating, and from the very beginning, you know the plot is going to fail, and it fails fast. At this point, it just feels like Tyler Perry is looking for an easy paycheck, and this series needs to die right now. That's all I'm gonna say. Coming in at number 4, The Upside. Made in 2017 but released in 2019, The Upside stars Kevin Hart, Brian Cranston and my girl Nicole Kidman and is a comedic look at the relationship between a wealthy man with quadriplegia and an unemployed man with a criminal record who's hired to help him. Now this film may sound familiar to you and that's because it's a remake of an incredibly moving French film called The Intouchables. Now unlike its predecessor, The Upside endured a lengthy development process for the better part of 5 years. Then following its debut at TIFF in 2017, the movie, which was produced by the Weinstein Company, sat on the shelf for the next year and a half due to the sexual allegations against Harvey Weinstein. However, the film was eventually purchased by STX Entertainment and released in 2019, but I'm thinking both the cast and crew were wishing it was still sitting on that dusty shelf right about now because the movie was truly awful. Film Inquiry's Asher Liberto put it best when he stated, I quote, You've seen it all before, and you've probably done it better. The film has fallen and can't get up. Ouch. Coming in at number 3, The Goldfinch. Look, I never like to badmouth Nicole Kidman, simply because she is one of my favourite actresses of all time. And yes, she steers in the wrong direction every now and then, but she is a goddamn gem. Anyway, released in September, The Goldfinch follows a boy in New York who is taken in by a wealthy Upper East Side family after his mother is killed in a bombing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, sadly, the film had a stellar cast, including Ansel Elgort, Luke Wilson, Sarah Paulson, Finn Wolfhard, and like I said, Nicole Kidman, but not even the stars could save the snooze fest that was The Goldfinch. The film is thematically dense and was always going to be trickier than most, however the source material proved a little too tricky for director John Crowley in this boring adaptation. Now the film itself does follow the book it's based on, however it lacks any sort of finesse, with David Sim stating, The film suffers from both an excessive faithfulness to its source and a general failure to translate that material into anything close to a gripping on screen narrative. Watching The Goldfinch is like having the plot of a novel read to you. Not the novel itself, but merely its long and winding synopsis, bite-sized summary that still manages to feel endless. Honestly, if you want to snooze, this is the film to do it in. Coming in at 2, Dark Phoenix. I love the X-Men franchise, but this was a film that even I struggled to get through. And guys, Sophie Turner is queen. Queen of the North. But not in this film, that's for sure. Released back in June, Dark Phoenix follows a young Jean Grey who begins to develop incredible powers that corrupt and turn her into a Dark Phoenix, causing the X-Men to decide if her life is worth more than all of humanity. Now, the film itself was set up to be the final send-off to all the heroes of the Fox-produced X-Men series. However, due to an extensive rework of the film's third act, which was in part due to the similarities to the MCU's smash hit Captain Marvel, it ended up being absolutely terrible. Matthew Lacona stated, I quote, It didn't have to end this way, in such thoroughly standard smash em up fashion with minor heroes dutifully duking it out with faceless hordes for punchy power bolt minutes after punchy power bolt minutes until the mayhem quota has been met and the principals can finally square off for their climactic light show. Wow, I felt that. Quite honestly, Dark Phoenix was so disappointing it does not deserve to be the final Fox X-Men movie. But alas, can't wait for Marvel to do it better. And finally coming in at number one, Gemini Man. Released just last week, Gemini Man, directed by Ang Lee and starring Will Smith, follows an over-the-hill hitman who faces off against a younger clone of himself. Yeah, even the plot sounds horrendous. Well, don't worry, it gets worse. Folks knew going in that the film would be a train wreck, but the level of the crash was truly unexpected. The film garnered just 24% on Rotten Tomatoes, with reviews like, roll up, roll up, see it now, see it once, and never see it again. And no matter how many presumably non-computer generated tears Smith sheds, he and Lee never transformed this baby hitman into a plausible science fiction conceit, let alone invest him with a soul. Gemini Man's major selling point was, of course, 
two Will Smiths, one of them being considerably younger with Hollywood once again showing off their de-aging technology. And yes, it's an intriguing idea and the effects are incredible, yet the film still manages to be unengaging, with the character development seemingly taking a backseat to the effects. Remember, cutting edge effects are great, but if you don't have a solid story to back them up, it's not worth our time or money. I don't want to see two Will Smiths, I barely like one. Coming in at 10, Men in Black International. Directed by F. Gary Gray, Men in Black International tells the story of, of course, the Men in Black, an organization who have always protected the Earth from the scum of the universe. In the new adventure, they tackle their biggest threat to date, a mole in the Men in Black organization. Now, I should preface this point by saying that folks were already unhappy with Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones not reprising their leading roles, and instead, Chris Hemsworth and my favorite Tessa Thompson took over. Sadly, Tessa couldn't save this movie, with many critics referring to the movie as meh in black. The movie is intensely tiresome and seems more pointless than anything. It it also feels insincere, and unfortunately for Tessa Thompson, she seems to have the life squeezed out of her by the terrible script and directing. The movie trudges through with you expecting it to get better, sadly that is not the case and the film lacks any real spark or shine. Coming in at 9, Holmes and Watson. Directed by Ethan Cohen, not to be confused with Ethan Cohen, never confuse the two, Holmes and Watson is a humorous take on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's classic mystery featuring Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. The movie stars comedy giant such as Will Ferrell, John C. Riley, and Rafe Fiennes. However, this movie is absolutely abysmal, with these actors hitting career lows. The iconic Holmes and Watson are depicted as needy, middle-aged man-children in the similar vein of Step Brothers. However, this is not Step Brothers. They may be confused. The accents are, of course, atrocious, and the jokes even worse, with the movie feeling like a bad improv show that you just can't seem to leave. You value your time and money. Do not watch this abhorrent piece of trash, which can't can't even do gross out humor correctly. Now that's saying something. Anyone can do gross out humor. Coming in at eight, The Queen's Corgi. I honestly thought this movie was a joke when I first read about it. Sadly, I was mistaken. Instead, someone actually funded this movie, and I'm shook. Directed by Vincent Castellut and Ben Stassen, The Queen's Corgi follows, of course, the British monarch's favorite dog, who gets lost from the palace and finds himself at a dog fight club. He then begins his long journey to find his way back home to the palace. Again, Sounds like a joke, right? A fight club for dogs. Yeah, I'm still not over it. Not only does it include a fight club, but also a pole dancing Saluki and a dog that very clearly represents Donald Trump. Now, I appreciate animated movies, but this one is very clearly trying to compete with the likes of Disney and DreamWorks. Yeah, it did not pay off, and this is why the top dogs remain on top. Don't be these people. Don't make that movie. Coming in at seven, Unicorn Store. I hate to do this, I really do, because as most of you will know, or should know, I love Brie Larson. She is a queen, and we are not worthy. However, she should not be a director, and I say that in the nicest way possible. Directed, again, by Brie Larson, the movie follows Kit, a 20-something dreamer who receives an invitation that would fulfill her childhood dreams. Starring Brie Larson, Samuel L. Jackson, and Joan Cusack, this is yet another a movie all about nepotism. We love nepotism. Considering that Brie and Samuel are friends, you can see why he was forced, I mean willing, to make this movie. <laughs> the movie is just straight up boring and bland. If a movie had a colour, this would be beige. Now, the acting is good, I can say that, but the script is poor and the directing mediocre. Sorry, Brie. Wow, I shouldn't script at home, I'm mean. <laughs> I'm too mean. <laughs> Coming in at six, Wonder Park. Directed by Dylan Brown, who is uncredited, wonder why? Wonder Park tells the story of an amusement park where the imagination of a wildly creative girl named June comes alive. With voice actors such as Jennifer Garner, Kena Thompson, Mila Kunis, Ken Jeong, and John Oliver, you would expect the movie to be at least somewhat enjoyable, right? Wrong. Not even the A-list cast could save this movie. Instead, it is just another poorly made family-oriented movie of 2019. And ironically, what makes this movie comical is the simple fact that it explores the ideas of imagination and innovation. Yet the movie lacks all of those things. Sad times. Sucks to be Wonder Park. Coming in at five, What Men Want. Directed by Adam Shankman, aka the man behind A Walk to Remember, Cheaper by the Dozen 2, Hairspray, and of course, everyone's favorite, the Miley Cyrus music video, when I look at you. Classic. What Men Want tells the story of a woman boxed out by the male sports agents in her profession, but gains an unexpected edge over them when she develops the ability to hear their thoughts. Now, this is of course the retelling of the Mel Gibson 
fiction movie What Women Want, which is the exact same storyline just with the reversal of genders. The only takeaway from this movie is that Taraji P. Jensen is a goddamn queen and incredible actress. Sadly though, she cannot save this movie, which at times is homophobic, with some of the big laughs coming when Taraji's character overhears that men are gay or doing some kind of gender non conforming thing. Yeah, that's a big no no. Overall, it is merely a broad, shallow mainstream comedy that at times is wildly offensive. Don't watch it. Coming in at number four, Brightburn, directed by David Yurovsky. Brightburn poses the question: What if a child from another world crash landed on Earth? But instead of becoming a hero to mankind, he proved to be something far more sinister. Now, the concept itself was incredibly unique and was, in essence, what if Superman was evil? Fascinating, right? Well, sadly, it did not pay off, with the execution lacking all suspense and surprise. Not only that, but it seemed like a cop out, considering the writers of the movie were the cousin and brother of producer James Gunn. Nepotism, again, at its finest. To make matters worse, the end of the movie suggests there may be a sequel coming, but I think it's safe to say we all collectively have our fingers crossed that there won't be happening. I would literally rather the happening to happen again, and that's saying something. What? No. Coming in at 3, The Silence. It hurts my soul that Stanley Tucci was in this movie because he is genuinely a very good actor, save for a few poor films. I mean, I love burlesque, but I know it's not the best. But he starred alongside Cher, and as you all know, Cher is my queen right now and she's the best thing. The Silence, directed by John R. Leonetti, centers on the world under attack by terrifying creatures who hunt their prey by sound, forcing Ali, a deaf teenage girl, and the rest of her family to seek refuge in a remote haven. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Dollar store, a quiet place? Maybe. The Silence is by far the worst horror movie of the year, if not the decade. And that's surprising considering its cat, Stanley Tucci, Kin and Shipka, and Miranda Otto. Not only is it not scary, it also had absolutely no suspense and no character development. It is a waste of time and money. Do not watch this movie. Coming in at two. Poms. Yet another movie on our list that I was confident was a joke, but was sadly mistaken when I realized someone paid for this movie. Sucks to be them. Directed by Zara Hayes, the movie stars Diane Keaton, Jackie Weaver, and that's about it, and follows a group of women who form a cheerleading squad at their retirement home in order to prove that you're never too old to bring it. Yeah, I feel sick just saying all of those words. As you would expect, considering this is our number two point, the writing was atrocious, with stale jokes and an uncomfortable blend of silliness and sickness. It stars a few A-list actors, yes, but it fails them tragically by making them humiliate themselves by performing cringy cheer routines. Not just that, but the women are then forced to perform at a high school pep rally. It's quite honestly a joke and more painful to watch than it is enjoyable. Don't ever subject your loved ones to this movie. You have been warned. And finally coming in at number one, The Dirt, directed by Jeff Tremaine and starring Douglas Booth and Machine Gun Kelly. The Dirt is based on the best-selling autobiography from Motley Crue, with the film being an unflinching tale of success and excess as four misfits rise from the streets of Hollywood to the heights of international fame. Sadly, this film like the rest of our numbers on our list, missed the mark. It is, to put it bluntly, vile and pure garbage. It seemed to be hoping to play off the success of films like Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man, but sadly this movie just felt misplaced, with casting choices that made zero sense. Not only that, but it was cheap, with poorly written dialogue. Make it feel like an old man tried to be hit with the youths. It does of course favour the scenes of sex and drugs, and surprisingly has very little concert scenes for a movie about a band. Honestly, don't watch this movie. It's not worth wasting 1 hour and 40 seven minutes of your time. Kicking off our countdown at number 10 is Doolittle. After Robert Downey Jr. took on the hero role of Iron Man in the most popular franchise in the world, people were wondering what he could do next after his character left. Most people definitely didn't expect him to take on the role of Doolittle in the retelling of the classic story. Unfortunately, the movie did not do very well and critics were quick to rip it apart. Peter Bradshaw from Guardians wrote, This is the family movie we didn't know we needed, because we didn't. It really is horrible, inert, and every time Downey opens his mouth to say something unintelligible, the film dies a bit more. That is actually one of the nicer reviews too, if I'm being honest. The movie received only 15% on Rotten Tomatoes and was also a total box office flop, earning $61.8 million but apparently had $115 million in global marketing costs alone. Just marketing costs. 
Coming in next is the last thing he wanted. The political drama seemed to have a lot going for it, including a killer cast like Anne Hathaway and Ben Affleck. It was an adaptation of the 1996 novel and was released to Netflix, which made it easier for everyone to watch it. But that might be the only positive thing about the movie. The screenplay itself was ripped to shreds by every critic, the majority of them agreeing with the fact that it was just bad. Isaac Feldberg from Fortunes wrote, The last thing he wanted is almost impressively bad. It begins in a state of near total incoherence and somehow meanders further from there, plunging into almost experimental territory with its choppily edited mess of ridiculous dialogue and hyper-dense plotting. The movie was one of the first ones in 2020 and hit theaters on January 27th, earning a whopping 6% on Rotten Tomatoes. Sniping the number eight spot is Brahms The Boy 2. The first movie titled The Boy came out back in 2016 and most people were excited to find out that there was a sequel. For those who never saw the first one, it told the story of a killer doll who guards the house that it lives in and it had one of the most shocking twist endings that we've seen in more recent years. But viewers were very disappointed after seeing the sequel, which only got a 10% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Benjamin Lee from The Guardians wrote a review and said, There's something willfully unscary about The Boy 2. It's so punishably dull to watch, filled with dry, perfunctory dialogue from Stacey Manners consistently, uninventive script, and shot without even a glimmer of style that even at a brisk 86 minutes, it feels like unending torture. In the number seven spot is Sonic the Hedgehog. Back in 2019, the trailer dropped for the new animation movie and people were quick to tear it apart saying they hated it and that it looked nothing like the original animation they were hoping for. So the movie was postponed and they completely redid the entire design and movie, which we have to give them some credit because that is some serious dedication. On November 12th, Jeff Fowler and Ben Schwartz happily announced the arrival of the new Sonic. People were thrilled with the new design and were finally excited to see the movie. But once the movie came out, it did not receive the best reviews and people said the six month delay fixed the design, but it did not fix how bad the movie was itself. Cruising into number six spot is The Turning. The movie seemed like a good idea on paper when creating an adaptation of the classic Henry James novel, The Turn of the Screw. It was produced by the one and only Steven Spielberg, so it was bound to be nothing but another success to add to his list. But critics were disappointed and called the movie incomprehensible. David Neusser from Real Film Reviews called The Turning, I quote, an absolutely abhorrent ghost story, an excessively deliberate drama that's almost entirely devoid of dread and atmosphere, an almost uncommonly intolerable contemporary horror flick. The movie definitely had a lot of potential from the outside looking in, but viewers claimed it was a waste. The Rotten Tomato judges also slammed it and it earned a massive uh, 12%. Steven Spielberg, 12%, that is crazy. We are halfway through our list and we have Fantasy Island. Some people were really excited to see the classic 70s television series be recycled and turned into a modern movie. The movie had Blumhouse behind it, which usually means that there's a solid horror thriller coming our way. But it's also a big risk seeing as the series ended long before most of the movie's target audience was even born. The movie was one of the most brutally reviewed movies of this year, so far. People were calling it gallingly stupid and that was one of the nicer remarks. One critic, Jason Schwan from Nashville Scene said, this film is such a haphazard stack of nested fantasies, it could be a Cinemax after dark film if it took any joy in anything. Blumhouse's Fantasy Island is an incoherent mess and it's effing exhausting. And just for fun, let me add in that the film only got an 8% on Rotten Tomatoes, not even in the double digits. We are here now at number four and we have Like a Boss. The movie was stacked with a killer cast, but it failed to capitalize on that fact. Tiffany Haddish and Rose Byron seemed like the perfect pair to make the audience laugh and bring in some good reviews, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> and people had no problem pointing out that fact. Alison Wilmore from Vulture said, how do you make a movie with this cast and have it be so devoid of joy? It's hard to guess whether the story was mangled by the studio's reddits or just didn't have much to say to begin with, both seem possible. The bigger question is why so many strong actors signed on for this misfire. It feels like a film whose point is clumsy misunderstood by the very people who created it. 
This one is a real shame in my opinion because it had a lot of potential. I love Tiffany Haddish. Um, however, it only got 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. Winning our third spot on this countdown is The Grudge. If you are a horror fan like me, then you are probably thrilled to know that there was a new Grudge movie coming out this year. The 2004 movie was one of the most popular scary films we saw that decade. So the reboot in 2020 edition was supposed to be just as promising. And I'm really irritated that I had to put it on this list. But many people considered the movie a flop and it didn't help that it only got a 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. The movie didn't have much from the original plot or any real scares in general, people said. Paul Whittington from The Independent was one of the many critics to point out that there seemed to be a lack of effort put into the film. He wrote, this is shoddy stuff, full of J-horror cliches and supposed jump scares you can see coming from a mile off. It's not particularly frightening, but it sure is depressing. Taking over the number two spot is The Jesus Rolls. The movie was centered around Jesus Quintana from The Big Lebowski, which sounds like a pretty decent idea for a new movie. The movie took a lot of time to make, but unfortunately it took a hard turn into a more cartoonish aspect of the character and, and ruined a lot of potential that it originally had. One critic from Flickfee said, the Jesus Rolls throws a gutter ball down the farcial greasy lane in, in an unimaginable sex buddy road flick where the thin layer juvenile raunchiness is a strikeout of the unwanted kind. <laughs> Let's just say that fans who waited a long time for the flick were super disappointed when they finally got to see it. And of course, the Rotten Tomatoes rating is 23%. In our number one spot is Birds of Prey. This one will probably bring up mixed emotions for some people because it really did have mixed reviews. Depending on who you talk to, some people will say they absolutely loved it while others will say it absolutely sucked. On Rotten Tomatoes, it did earn 78%, which is a really good rating. And you can't say that Margot Robbie's performance was not killer. But there's a lot of people online who said they weren't into the movie plot itself and called it irrelevant. Peter Travers from The Rolling Stone wrote, slapping the topical theme of female empowerment on a story that trucks in business as usual violence does not qualify as a game changer. Of course, I loved the idea of it being a female-based hero movie, but not everyone was a fan. I would love to hear your opinions. Let me know in the comments. Beginning on list number 10 is Evan Almighty. The movie was meant to be a sequel spinoff of Jim Carrey's hit, Bruce Almighty. But this time, Steve Carell took the lead and told the story of a congressman named Evan Baxter who gets a visit from God who asks him to build an ark for an upcoming flood. The movie must have seemed like a good idea at the time since it had more than double the budget of Bruce Almighty, but the biblical comedy bombed despite being the most expensive comedy ever made at that time. It received a 23% on Rotten Tomatoes and was the furthest thing from a hit. It remains to be one of the biggest box office bombs in history, thanks to its insane budget. The budget for this movie, drum roll please, was $175 million and they only earned back 174. Not even breaking even. Ooh, that kills me. Not, I'm sorry, but you, come on. You should have known you could not compete with Jim Carrey's Bruce Almighty. Next up at number nine is Catwoman. Halle Berry had the chance to take on the superhero role, probably not knowing that it would become legendary for how bad it was. It was originally supposed to be a spinoff of Batman Returns with Michelle Pfeiffer returning to play the hero, but they reworked it into a standalone movie and gave the part to Halle instead. She won the Razzie for Worst Actress and accepted it in person with her Best Actress Academy Award in her hand, just to remind everyone uh, that she's not this bad. The movie's budget was $100 million and they weren't even close to breaking even, only earning back 82 million of that. <sighs> what a waste. Sliding into number eight is Zeroville. After landing himself in some serious scandals, James Franco took some years off from acting, but made his return in 2019 with this movie. The film was created by him and he also starred alongside big names like Megan Fox, Seth Rogen, and Joey King. It's hard to say what about the film made it so terrible, but after being released in some theaters, it received a ton of negative reviews. The movie was nominated for three Golden Raspberry Awards and was one of the biggest box office flops of that year. It was the worst for James's career. Let's just say that. And it made a total of $78,000. 
78,000. I mean, we gotta compare that to what James usually makes in his movies, which is like millions. That's a rough go. Rolling into the number seven spot is Jupiter Ascending. The people behind this movie were also behind the Matrix, so it wasn't expected to be such a big flop. Jupiter Ascending was meant to launch a brand new sci-fi franchise, hoping that it would be an epic one. It also had two huge stars as the lead, Channing Tatum and Mila Kunis. Some people praise the movie for having cool special effects and a unique storyline, but it barely managed to break even with its big $179 million budget. It made back $182 million, so only profited a couple million dollars. Which for us is like, whoa, I'll take a couple million dollars, but for them, it's nothing. It also received a 27% on Rotten Tomatoes. Although I gotta say, seeing Channing Tatum and Mila Kunis paired up for a movie was kind of exciting. For me anyways. Coming to the number six spot is Holmes and Watson. Speaking of another exciting pair, this one had two of the funniest guys in Hollywood, but somehow was still a major flop. Will Ferrell and John C. Riley teamed up to play the famous detective duo, but the comedy spoof was dubbed by many critics as the worst film of 2018. Their budget was only 42 million and they made back 41.9 of that, just shy of breaking even. Turns out that the movie was actually so bad, Sony tried to sell distribution rights to Netflix, but Netflix declined. They did not want it. The New York Times review was also recommending to audiences that they sneak booze into the theater to make it tolerable. It's hard to believe that this movie would be so bad with this kind of duo. I mean, these guys killed it in Step Brothers. So I don't know what happened with this one. We've made it halfway and we have From Justin to Kelly. Remember that time when Kelly Clarkson acted in a movie? Yeah. It was after the first season of American Idol was a huge hit and she won the top prize with Justin Guarani taking second place. So what better idea than to make a musical comedy and feature both of them in it? Sadly, it did not succeed in the musical genre or the comedy category. Critics tore apart the script, said the choreography was bad, and just said that it was not a good way to showcase two rising musical stars. Their budget was $12 million and they only made back $4.9 million. It also received a 10% on Rotten Tomatoes. And to this day, Kelly Clarkson says that she regrets doing the movie. When asked about it, she said, when I won, I signed that piece of paper and I could not get out of it. Girl, I get it. Moving on to number four, we have Good Luck Chuck. Dane Cook was one of the hottest comedians at the time, but he was never able to turn his fame into a successful movie career. He tried though, with Good Luck Chuck being one of his attempts. It was a good effort though, he was paired up with Jessica Alba for the lead roles in the movie. But the movie didn't make audiences laugh like his comedy normally did, and only received 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. That has been the lowest rating on our list so far. It did earn some money at the box office, but made it on several worst film of the year lists. Many reviews said that Dane should just stick to voiceover work and his comedy skits. I agree, he is a good comedian. Cruising into number three is The Lone Ranger. Disney went all in with this one when they wanted to make a reboot of The Lone Ranger. They threw in a huge budget of $250 million and put Johnny Depp as the lead. They were hoping that this one would replicate the same success of Pirates of the Caribbean, so they actually hired the original Pirates director and screenwriters too. On top of their massive budget, they also spent a whopping $150 million on marketing costs like on top of the 250. So we know that they were trying really hard to make this one a hit, but the gamble with all of their spending did not pay off. Critics and audiences found the movie was too dark, too violent, and way too long. The movie ended up costing Disney $160 million. So uh, that took a huge loss to say the least. Taking over second place on our countdown is Transformers The Last Night. It's hard to believe that a Transformers movie would flop, seeing as the franchise has had massive success overall. And to be fair, it wasn't a complete fail when it comes to money because it did earn over $600 million at the box office, but that is not the only factor that decides if a movie is good or not. This was the fifth installment of the franchise and ended up losing Paramount $100 million because of their budget. It only scored 15% on Rotten Tomatoes and critics claim that this was by far the worst one of the series. The movie is criticized for being confusing, too loud, mean-spirited, and overall just ridiculous. Honestly, not gonna lie, I kind of stopped watching them. 
ones. They got worse over time, in my opinion. Winning the number one place is Cats. This movie was highly anticipated ever since they first announced that they were going to make this live action version with all of Hollywood's biggest stars. Seriously, like this movie was packed with celebrities. I think that's why we all thought there was no way that it could fail. Their budget was $95 million and only made back 74 of it. But not only was it a box office flop, the audience was super disappointed with the outcome. It only got a 21% on Rotten Tomatoes. I just have to say, I don't know why someone ever thought that this was gonna be a good idea. You can pack a movie with all these celebrities, but when they are dancing and they're trying to sing in these weird cat outfits, it's just, oh, I don't know why you thought this was gonna be a hit. It just kills me. 